Hey guys, in this video we'll take a look at some of the questions you guys have asked. But first, let's unpeel the foil that's been on the screen for the past few days. Back side first. And the front side. And no, this isn't some uh, foil that should be kept on the screen. This is the actual protective foil. First step is selecting the right screws and we ended up using the M6 times 12 millimeter screws because with a washer that was more than deep enough for the screen. Using a too deep screw can risk damaging the internals or actually poking through the front so make sure you look at that before you select the screw you want to use. Next up was exactly measuring the spot on the wall and this Vogel 545 thin uh, wall mount comes with a easy to use chart that you can put on the wall which will exactly depict where the screen will go. Now in regards to measurements, we took a look at where the wall mount will sit on the bracket you mount on the back of the TV and then compare that to the wall and that's how we did our measurements to get it in exactly the right spot where we wanted it. Now, if the wall mount is already in place, that of course isn't possible, but you can move the bracket on the back of the TV, left and right or up and down, to position it exactly like you want it. To make sure we got all the measurements correctly and we were level uh, both horizontally and vertically, I used the new laser level I got uh, or showed off in one of my latest Quinbox episodes. That worked really well and helped us out a lot. Next up was drilling the holes. And these screws are really, really long and thick. We actually measured before we drilled the holes if we wouldn't go through the stone in the wall. That wasn't the case, so we drilled some little pilot holes like the instructions tell you to do, and then we drilled the big holes. My girlfriend was a big help through all of this process, and once we had the bracket on the wall and, well, again leveled using the laser level while uh, securing the screws, we were ready to put the screen on. Now the screen slots in the bottom and the top of the bracket you see here, and then you can secure it with those silver nuts which we left the tape on. That way it sits securely on the arm, and well, it's a really sturdy construction. When they said thin, they really meant it. I believe them when they say it's only three and a half centimeters or 1.24 inches from the wall when completely flat, and adding the thickness of the back of the electronics and the screen itself, it comes down to about 9 cm or a little bit more than 3, 3.5 three inch from the wall. But that's really good. I don't see how you could get it any closer than that. This arm is basically made up out of two sections, which can move individually, and they can actually pivot left and right of the wall bracket, and that gives you a lot of flexibility. Using an arm like this over the included stand gives you a lot of desk space and also allows you to get the screen at the right height you want it to be. In this shot you can also see a good comparison between the 48 inch screen and the 27 inch screen. Now this Vogel 545 arm isn't cheap but it allows you to pivot the screen to the left and the right which is a functionality I wanted to have and you can easily move it forward and then still do the same and if you look at the back, I haven't used this yet, but it also has a tilt function if you'd need it. One of the questions that was asked in the comments is how much power the screen uses and how warm it gets. Well, how warm it gets, I'll include later in the video. I have a FLIR thermal camera, so I'll include some shots, and that's actually pretty interesting. 
But right now, let's take a look at power usage. Power usage varies a lot depending on what's on the screen. If the screen is really dark, it uses about 50 to 60 watts of power. And if it's really bright, it can use up to 140 watts of power with eco mode disabled. Um, I'll be showing that uh, during the video too. And uh, after that, we'll also take a look at playing some Doom at 120 hertz with HDR enabled and black frame insertion on low. So here you can see if you disable any energy saving, it can go up to 150 watt. And I think with HDR content on there, it could even be more. But average usage on my desktop with eco mode on, which is bright enough for me normally, I'd say is between well 60 and 100 watt. Which I think is pretty okay given the size of the screen. Okay, let's uh, launch up Doom and see how that does. Turning on OLED Motion Pro to low actually lowers energy usage a little bit because the pixels become dimmer. Or dimmer on average because they are probably being blanked at a certain ratio in the background. Okay, let's uh, watch some gameplay footage. During gameplay it seems to hover between 80 and 110 watts, and that is with the eco mode still turned on. And again, it really depends on what is being displayed on the screen at that moment in time. Next up is to demonstrate the screen properties really. This is a 4K 60 frames per second HDR clip I ripped from YouTube. And uh, it's being played in HDR in Windows desktop mode. And well, just look at the pretty images. And while it's doing that, we can talk about some other questions that were asked. First off, a question I got through a lot of different uh, ways is how did you manage to buy this? Well, the Netherlands was included as one of the first launching countries, and I think I might have snagged a demo model from the store, because I happened to call the day they got it in, and they said they hadn't unpacked it yet to display it. I was like, eh, just keep it in the box and I'll come and get it. 
And there's actually a sticker in the box that normally comes with the demo display units. So yeah, that's basically the story. Uh, someone in the comments asked if I considered using a rolling amount so that I could roll the screen around. Uh, no, I didn't really. I kind of uh, toyed with a project like this a few years back already, and I tested three TVs which all weren't up to specs, and, well, I didn't end up using them as a monitor. Um, but I kind of designed the room to be able to house a screen this big in this spot while I was designing and building the house. So, for me, I always had a wall mount in mind. That's also why I went with a slightly more expensive wall mount, because maybe in 3 or 5 or whatever year's time, I'll replace whatever is on it, but I'll keep the same mount. There was of course a lot of discussion about the size, and if I'm honest, 48 inch is still a bit big. I would have rather had maybe a 40 or 43 inch screen with the same 4K resolution, because for 48 inch, 4K, if you're sitting this close, is still a bit of a low resolution really, but I didn't want to wait either. If you look at current gaming monitors and what's coming out right now, for 1500 bucks, which is about the same this guy costs, you get an, an average IPS LCD screen, maybe with a local dimming, yeah, 4K resolution, but only 27 inches, and it, it's just not much better, or if at all. I think this OLED with a variable frame, G-Sync, HDR, real HDR, not crappy IPS monitor HDR, uh, 120 hertz, 4K over HDMI. I think it's a really good package. And if you're into gaming, I think it's a really, really good deal versus a ga an expensive gaming monitor. For desktop usage, it's a bit of a mixed bag. I'll talk about that in an upcoming video. It's certainly usable, it's not that bad, but there are some things you need to take into account. And as I mentioned in my previous video, distance from the screen is a big factor in that. In the same corner, someone asked me about workflow, and, well, I haven't been doing anything special. The normal snapping that's in Windows 10 has worked pretty well for me, and otherwise I just move windows around and position them how I like them. Somebody asked if I could check the tuner capabilities, and it actually has DVB-C for cable, DVB-T and T2 for terrestrial or air, and DVB-S and S2 for satellite, but sadly I don't have an antenna, so I did try the aerial or air reception, but I couldn't get any channels. So I also won't be able to tell you how sensitive it is and how well that works. Another question was if the TV can do picture in picture. And I think the answer should be yes, because if I open the browser app on the TV, for instance, I can have a little overlay window with HDMI 1 where I have my computer connected. But that functionality is very limited right now. Online, I read some stuff about a multi-view app you can install, but I couldn't find that in the LG App Store because I think this model is so new, they haven't published it for it yet. But later on, if that app becomes available, I'm pretty sure it has the hardware for it, so that should be possible. Somebody also asked if you could record HDMI 1 input to an internal HDD. I connected a USB stick, but there's no recording functionality for HDMI inputs. I think it's only for if you're using one of their tuners and the program guides to set that up. Then a big one a lot of people asked about is custom resolution support. And I've been testing this for a few hours already and it's really uh, well long-winded to test because if you hit a resolution that doesn't work, I kind of have to force shut down my PC and then sometimes it comes back with that resolution. I have to connect another monitor and test it again. And Well, all I can say for now is that any custom resolution with a higher than 60 FPS frame rate does not work except for 1440p, which is already exposed, and also 1920 by 1200 and 1920 by 1080 I could get with 120 hertz. Any other resolution, anything other than 60 hertz, didn't work. For 60 hertz, uh, I was able to do 3840 by 1600. That worked fine, and I was also able to do 3040, 3440 by 1440, and that also worked fine as long as I had scaling enabled. 
If I turned off scaling, it again wouldn't work anymore. So I know there's probably all kinds of combinations you'd want me to test, but as I said, if I hit anything that doesn't work, the whole PC or graphics card or whatever just basically locks up, so it takes a really long time to test. As you can see on the table on the screen, I did test a lot of other resolutions, but I couldn't get any of those to work. Now, I only have a GTX 1080 with an HDMI 2.0B port. The RTX series officially has the same spec port, but there they officially enable G-Sync. There were some comments if I could illegally basically enable G-Sync. I tried looking in that, into that a little bit, but I couldn't really verify if it was working or not. Right now, like in Doom, I'm using Adaptive Sync, and what that does is it, it's basically um, without any V-Sync enabled up to 120 Hertz, which the screen is set to at that moment. And once it hits 120 Hertz, it acts like it has V-Sync enabled. So that kind of gives you best of both worlds without having G-Sync, which actually matches the screen sync rate. So for now, those are the most tests I can do in that regard. If you have a very specific request, let me know down under the video and I hope I can try them later on, but it's, it's tough testing these things. A quick note in that regard, in the NVIDIA control panel, you can choose to either have the GPU or the display scale. And during all my checking with custom resolutions and stuff like that, I found that having the scaling done by the display instead of the GPU looked best. So here is that FLIR thermal camera shot as I mentioned, and I kept it with the HDR uh, bright sun that was in the end shot of the video we just saw enabled. And as you can clearly see, there's actually a hot patch there, which, well, it's hotter than the rest of the screen. There's also some hotter parts at the bottom of the screen. I'm suspecting that all the power lines run through there, so they become a little bit hot because they are delivering power to the rest of the screen. Once I move the window with the HDR highlight to the bottom left, the spot where the hot patch was before actually starts decreasing in temperature, and now the spot in the bottom left starts increasing in temperature. So the temperature of the screen is very dependent on the content being displayed. Now there's of course going to be limits in total power usage, and uh, I, haven't, I don't have all the equipment to do tests like that, you can look at rtings.com, they have a very detailed test report about the CX series, but I hope that gives you some insight in regards to temperature and the screen itself. I haven't noticed any heat radiating off it myself, and as we saw during normal desktop usage, it's between 80 and 100 watts, and that really isn't much for a 48 inch screen. One thing I wanted to quickly update on is screen shift. Before I mentioned that I couldn't really see it doing anything, but after using the screen more and more, I've actually caught it moving the screen and all the pixels on it. So what it does, it actually moves the whole picture, left, right, top or bottom, I think three to four pixels. I haven't been able to count it exactly yet. And here are some shots where you can clearly see that some stuff is slightly cut off and at first I thought, oh, damn it, how can I get some overscan or underscan or whatever like that because I'm using a fully digital system. But as it turns out, it was actually the screen shift because the second I turn it off, it fits exactly right on the screen. So the screen shift is moving the screen around a little bit. I've actually caught it doing it once or twice because suddenly your whole screen moves two or three pixels to the left. I don't think you'll ever see it using this thing as a normal TV, but when you're one meter close and, well, you, your content shifts just that slightly to the left, right, top or bottom, it, you see it. Uh, what, now that I know what it is, I'm not really bothered by it, so I'll leave it enabled because, well, clearly there to prevent burn-in, and uh, I think I can live with it being enabled. A quick note on input lag after having used it for a few days now. Um, according to my senses, it's great. I don't really have the facilities to measure it, but I can certainly notice a difference between putting it into game and PC mode versus outside of that. 
and once it's in game and PC mode, to me it feels exactly like a normal monitor. There was also some talk about enabling BFI that it might raise input lag, but I have actually had BFI at low and, and auto to test it on my desktop, as you could see in my previous video, and I didn't notice any mouse lag, which I've noticed it before, especially when I did a test on TVs a few years back. That was really a thing. If it's 30, 35 milliseconds, for instance, I will notice it because the mouse becomes very spongy. But this feels exactly the same as my normal gaming monitors. And this is my desktop still running at 60 hertz. At 120 hertz, it's supposed to only be even better. So I don't think people need to worry about it in that regard. If you want actual measurements, I'll again link to the excellent Artings article in the video description where they tested input lag using specialized equipment. And there also it did excellently. And well, that concludes this video. I hope this answered some of the questions you guys had, but if you have more, please make sure to write them down in the comments and I'll try to get through them in a future video. I'm planning some more videos. One will be about the different pixel structure of the OLED because it's RGBW instead of RGB and what you maybe need to change in Windows to adhere to that. And probably another video, because it's a much asked question, is how is it to game using a PC on this monitor or TV? But as I said, that's for future videos. All the comments and questions are welcome in the comments on YouTube down below. Thank you for watching, and uh, well, again, I hope to see you back in the next video. Bye-bye.